you might get a message um, to let you know that this is the session is being recorded. Um, I'm Dr. Takenaka from the University of Hawaii Department of Geri Geriatrics, uh, and we're going to talk about monoclonal antibody treatment uh, for COVID-19 um, and prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and this is primarily for uh, casirivimab and demivab, which we have more readily available at nursing homes. Uh, and mostly regarding treatment in a nursing home setting for, for our purposes. I'm going to admit a few more people here, make sure everybody's muted. Okay, everybody's muted. Um, if you're joining, please make sure you remain muted here. And then we'll, we'll talk about questions or you can, um, yeah, we'll talk about questions afterwards, maybe in the chat. Any more people? Coming in, I think we're okay. I think we're good. I might have to pause to let my fellow in. Oh, two more people. Okay, let's get started. Get rid of this, get rid of this. Okay, so today we're going to talk about casirivimab and demivab, also known in the brand name as RegenCov. Um, I, I looked up mostly information on this one because this is what we have uh, readily available through most of our pharmacies, our Pharmerica in the nursing home setting, um, but there might be different preparations available in other sites. Um, so just so you guys understand the background information about this treatment, uh, especially when you might be, you know, talking to the patients or the families when they have questions. How does it work? Um, it almost, um, it, it kind of stops the virus from being able to stick to the human cells before they enter the host cells. So this is the virus here, this blue thing with the yellow DNA and RNA inside, and the antibodies are going to stick to their spike proteins, uh, which are the proteins on the outside of the virus, uh, which they use to um, attach to host cells in the human body uh, and then start to enter the human cells. So it's like neutralizing the mechanism that viruses use to enter our cells. This is a way of providing passive immunity to patients who receive treatment, uh, which is temporary, at least it, the onset is rapid, not always as long lasting as your active immunity, which will always be our first line, uh, which is why we really encourage everyone to get vaccinated um, because that provides active immunity. This would be added protection. Uh, so just looking at a little bit of the timeline, the FDA authorized emergency use uh, beginning in November 2020 uh, for treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 for patients who are high risk for severe infections, including hospitalization and death. And for uh, one of the groups that they mentioned was 65 and up. So slam dunk for a lot of our patients already in the nursing home and geriatrics. Um, because this is almost all of our patients. In July, 2021, 
It was also uh, approved for post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for individuals who are high risk of progressing to severe disease uh, if they do get COVID-19, including hospitalization and death. So not everyone would meet this criteria, um, but one of the categories for those who were included are high risk for exposure to COVID-19, including those who are in the same nursing home, uh, patients who are not fully vaccinated. So if they didn't get the two doses that they need for Moderna or Pfizer, or two weeks away from completion of their COVID vaccine, or if they're immunocompromised, so you don't expect that they would have a good immune response to the vaccines, um, they might qualify for post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent them from not, not primarily getting COVID-19, but from getting any disease from COVID-19 that would progress to severe disease, hospitalization, or death. Uh, there are several studies, uh, but the main study that uh, led to the approval uh, for treatment uh, is in the PCR positive patients uh, with COVID. They look for patients who are at least 18, had onset of symptoms less than seven days. That's why they say, you know, get the treatment within 10 days of onset of treatment, onset of symptoms. The total uh, N was 3,867. The study did start off with placebo versus a dose of 1,200 milligrams of casirivimab and indemivab. And then later on, they tapered it down to 600 milligrams um, for the treatment dose because they found that it was just as effective in terms of the primary outcomes. That's why you see some studies will have that 1200 and some studies will have that 600 is because they found that the lower dose is just as good. The primary outcomes was to look at COVID-19 related hospitalizations and all cause deaths. And for all of us, that's our major goal uh, when it comes to COVID-19. We're really trying to keep our, our nursing home patients at home um, uh, within our facility and trying to keep them away from the hospitals where they are, you know, really stressed for beds um, and that higher risk for other, you know, um, hospital related problems for our population. They found a 2.2% absolute reduction. So that's when you minus the incidence of the severe COVID infections, hospitalizations or death. Uh, and a 70% relative risk reduction over 29 days uh, between the patients who got placebo versus treatment with the monoclonal antibodies. And this is statistically significant. Uh, so when you are arranging for um, getting ready to provide treatment uh, or even post-exposure prophylaxis for patients in your facility, this is kind of the workflow that you want to start like planning for. It's really important ahead of time to look at your policy, make an update to it if there's anything that you need to, you know, <clears throat> even start to outline to get ready. Don't let your policy delay offering treatment. And it's really good when you already have an outline and a structure and a protocol to support your staff when you do need to provide treatment. Um, really look at, you know, um, how are we going to format our consent forms? Um, there's order templates available from Pharmerica. A lot of you might have already seen those. Uh, and the FDA also has uh, fact sheets for both healthcare professionals uh, and patients and families. So at the end of this presentation, I have some resources where you guys can get those. Uh, and it would be nice to either have them readily available to email to them or to share with and print it out in person to the patients who need to make their decisions uh, so that you're not, once you have a PUI, it's already a lot of things that you have to get done. So once you look at this policy and get ready uh, and maybe print out a few copies ahead of time uh, so that you're prepared. Once you do have a patient that you suspect to have COVID, send the SAT PCR testing, of course, isolation for infection control, 
Then at the same time, already start filling out your forms. Um, talk to the patient and the family about getting consent while you wait for the results to come out. We've seen just over the past month or so with the spike in Hawaii that you could get a PCR result within the same shift within eight hours. And in some cases when it got very, very busy in two days. Uh, and so you really want to be able to provide them with treatment as soon as possible for the best results. Um, we do want to be able to provide them with treatment before they desat, before they require oxygen, because then they don't meet the criteria to receive this treatment or before they get sick enough to go to the hospital. So filling out the paperwork ahead of time helps. Uh, definitely, if your patients or families have questions or reservations, really utilize your attending physicians and your medical directors uh, to help to communicate with the patients and families uh, so that they know what they're getting into if they want to ask questions um, and so they can uh, feel okay about signing that consent form. A lot of times we're not going to have family in the facility, so document that you receive verbal consent as well. At the same time, it's good for your attending MDs in your facility to know that it will be available and you do intend to offer treatment for patients who are eligible. Uh, so it's not a surprise to them and they know what your protocol is. Because uh, as soon as you get that positive PCR result, you want to inform the attending MD uh, so that they can give you a verbal order or written order if you have EMR uh, to expedite uh, sending the order to your pharmacy it's really helpful to call them to confirm that they received the order and you're not waiting for a delivery. To administer uh, the monoclonal antibody, uh, this is with the vial that is co-formulated with both the casirivimab and the indemivab, 600 milligrams each uh, in a vial that's uh, about 10 ml, a little bit more maybe. A lot of most of my experience um, so far in our facilities has been sub-Q. And so when you look at the letter, uh, the fact sheet for healthcare providers, it does say that if you can get IV access, this is what they recommend because this is where the study mainly gave um, IV administration. They did test for safety and sub-Q administration and the outcomes were about the same in terms of efficacy um, and maybe a little bit more, 12% of the sub-Q patients had some localized skin reaction, but very few were severe. Uh, for the IV axis, what you do need to have is, first of all, you know, a good vein, and they have to get the IV in, but also um, IV line with a PES filter. You can talk with your pharmacy about supplies ahead of time. Uh, and you would administer the entire dose, 10 ml, mixed in normal saline. Um, on the website for RegenCov, they do have tables where you mix it with varying amounts of normal saline. Um, but just for an example, I put a 50 ml, if you have those, uh, 20, over 20 minutes or slower. Afterwards, you flush the IV line with 25 cc of normal saline and you monitor. For the sub-Q injections, which we've done a lot because um, just, you know, with the amount of testing and positive patients that we've been seeing, along with the patients that we're considering for post-exposure prophylaxis, the dosing is the same for both treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and in, in order to administer this to multiple patients and monitor them all at the same time, uh, we were just able to get the treatment to them faster using sub-Q injections. What you'll need is four 5 ml syringes. Use a 21 uh, gauge needles to draw them out of the vial, uh, 2.5 ml into each syringe, and then one of your sub-Q uh, needles to switch out for administration. Uh, the vials for both IV and sub-Q should be allowed to reach room temperature. So, you know, on the mainland, room temperature is like 77 degrees. Uh, they said 20 minutes out of refrigerator. Well, you really want to watch uh, in Hawaii, don't, don't expose the vials to heat anywhere or have them near windows. Uh, it might take a little bit shorter than removing from 
the refrigerator in 20 minutes in Hawaii. Do not shake the vial. You can invert it gently. Uh, and then you draw 2.5 ml into four syringes. Your total dose is still going to be 10 ml. And then you, sub you administer it uh, as soon as possible. So some places, let's say if you're doing a high volume of treatment, uh, they did say that it is possible to draw them up, but you don't want to wait any longer than four hours at room temperature uh, because there's no preservatives in these vials. Uh, so it's just better to, as soon as you draw them up, administer it. Don't, don't let it sit around anywhere. Definitely for your bookkeeping, make sure you document the lot number of the vial, the date and time, uh, and the sites of administration. So it's going to be four sub-Q injections of 2.5 ml, all at the same time at four different sites. And I'm going to show you where you can look. Similar to other sub-Q injection sites that you would use for other therapeutics, anywhere where you have a good amount of sub-Q fat, or you want to avoid anywhere around the waistline. You can imagine you don't want to have false um, reports of, sorry, let me admit this person here. There you go. You want to avoid anywhere where the skin could already get irritated from the waistband uh, or your incontinence breathe. So try not to give it anywhere where they could have redness or irritation from anything else um, because you're really going to be watching for adverse effects at the injection site. Um, at the upper arm, abdomen, stay two inches away from the navel, as with other sub-Q injections, and the upper thigh. You don't have to wait a given amount of time between injections. Um, and what's nice about it is you could just do one, two, three, four, and then start your one hour for monitoring of adverse effects. So it kind of removes that extra time that you need to monitor them for IV infusion on top of one hour of uh, post-treatment monitoring. Uh, to monitor the patients, you need to watch them for at least one hour. One hour is about the time window when they saw most of their anaphylactic reactions. Uh, or other serious reactions. Um, there are some reactions to infusion as well. Um, and they are similar to these signs that they said to watch for. 0.2% of the study participants among the 4,000 uh, had moderate to severe adverse events. So uh, when you talk about the risk for adverse events is less than even 1% uh, of the patients in the study. Um, signs of hypersensitivity reactions could include this long list. And definitely you want to make sure you're monitoring vitals, especially uh, any swelling, wheezing, other signs of anaphylaxis as you would with any other treatment that you give IV like antibiotics. You do want to have on hand um, epinephrine that you could administer IM for anaphylaxis. And most of us have those in our e-kits. Um, you could also have diphenhydramine that you could administer IM if you also have allergic reactions. Um, mandatory reporting. So the events that you must report within seven days to this website on the FDA is anything life-threatening, anything that required hospitalization or surgery, any subsequent congenital anom anom anomaly or birth defect, or anything that required other um, surgical or medical intervention to prevent something severe. These are the references and resources that I use to help make this um, in service. I included all the links. So when I send to you guys a PDF of this presentation, I hope you can click on it to find the links. There's a fact sheet for patients um, and caregivers. I feel the reading level is still a little high, so it helps to know about it yourself so you can explain it in plain language. 
There's a fact sheet for the health providers. It's nice to be able to provide this to your medical staff. Uh, the Regen Cov website, they have a really nice graphically uh, pleasing uh, interface to review the instructions for administration of both IV uh, and sub Q. So I, I like looking at that website for the instructions if you need a review. There's a YouTube video um, from um, HHS that they produce to explain to patients and families about monoclonal antibody as treatment for COVID-19. Uh, and you know, for your staff or anyone who doesn't have a healthcare provider that is interested in post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, they can call this Combat COVID Monoclonal Antibody Call Center uh, to uh, find out about access in their region. Uh, I did see a news article in maybe on the 10th, not too long ago, uh, about uh, the Department of Health is going to be arranging for providers to come to Hawaii, I think, later this month. Uh, to help with access to treatment for monoclonal autobody in the outpatient setting. So that will be exciting. We'll see that roll out later this month. Along with the different healthcare facilities, I think um, at least Straub in the respiratory evaluation clinic, they might have resources for at least referral, if not treatment as an outpatient. The caveat to this treatment is that you have to be at a facility where you can either receive um, emergency treatment for an adverse reaction, especially anaphylaxis, or be able to activate EMS readily. So someone who can monitor you for an hour. So I'm not sure how this would be doable with home health unless the team stays there for an hour if you do home visits. Okay, so let me see. That's the end of the presentation. Is there any questions that you guys want to chat or unmute? First of all, thank you very much, doctor. This is Roselle. We appreciate. Um, we were actually very excited to um, do uh, when we heard that you, it was available. So thank you very much. Um, I guess it's very new. Um, we are just excited hearing about the availability of the treatment. So we don't have much questions about it because um, we did have one case at the facility at one point, but we were just uh, lucky to um, to have it a simple case. We didn't have um, much complications on it, but it's really, I was telling my team that it's very important for us to be ready. And that, that because these are available, then it's ready. It's very important for us to know about it too. So um, we have been in contact with Farmerica, and um, and we see where we're gonna head. And this is just a good boost for it, and we truly appreciate that. I think I think I have like uh, eight members of my nursing team in the in, in the in the call. So I'm very very excited, and thank you for all of them that are um, dialed in. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Annabelle, do you have any questions? Um, so far, I don't have. <laughs> but thank you very much, doctor. I think it's really important, especially at the facility level, that you guys are prepared for just the structure and be able to provide a policy and a procedure for this so that at any time you guys can offer treatment as soon as possible. What we really wanna do is to be able to get testing done, uh, get consent and education done before the patient desats. Cause our overall goal is to prevent them from going to the hospital and of course death. And these were the primary outcomes for the evidence uh, in this treatment. And so this all aligns with what we are fighting to do in the nursing home um, all over the state. Doctor, in the financial aspect, um, is this like a skilled service that it is uh, that is covered under a, a client's insurance? So um, the medication itself should be covered. So you can talk to Farmerica about that because I think it's through federal or state funding. The administration through IV um, is covered by Medicare, but I think not by Medicaid. Um, and it differs between 
the uh, private insurance. I think Kaiser is offering it in their outpatient settings. So I'm sure that they cover something in the nursing facility if you ask them ahead of time. So it's really good to work out these logistics in your facility or your patient population. So that won't be a barrier to getting them treatment in a timely manner. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you guys all know how to get in touch with me. Uh, and at any time, you could let me know if you have questions or you could ask your good medical director. But thank you guys for attending. Thank you, doctor. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.